So we're gonna start from the bottom and build a weather application from zero, starting with the database, all the way up to the endpoint. Now, we only have about 15 minutes, so we're gonna see if we can get this all done in time. So the first thing we're going to do is kind of start with this example. So here's a terminal. Everyone like terminals, is that cool? Someone's like, where's my GUI? <laughs> we'll get there. All right, so what I want to do is maybe start with a, a few leather, weather locations. So these are all of our regions in the US, our newest region being Los Angeles, California. And the goal is I want to take these names and get weather data. Now, here's the problem. I can't just give these names to the weather service. I actually have to give them geo coordinates, OK? Now, I have a couple of options here. I can actually use the Maps API. So the Google Cloud Maps platform does provide a Places API that I can trade those names in and get back some coordinates or something close. And then once I have those, I can actually send those to the weather.gov and actually get back coordinates. But here's the thing. I don't have a lot of time to write all of this code. Now, once you become a senior engineer, I'm going to teach you a couple of tricks. Now, this is what all senior engineers do. You guys ready for the first pro tip? Now, you got to write some code. Now, this is what we do. You do this. If you haven't heard of Stack Overflow, <laughs> you have no clue what's going on. All right, so uh, let's do this. Google Maps platform. Like, this is high quality code that you can find on this thing, man. Trust me. And we'll do weather. And then, uh, OK, let's go here. All right, how do we do this? Oh, code. This looks legit. All right. I'm not sure who this Terrence Ryan guy is, but uh, you know. Now, this is the internet. So what you got to do is you got to scan for those security vulnerabilities. All right, you got to make sure this stuff is legit. Hold on, let's make sure we can grab this. Let's see what we're going to do here. So let's grab this code. Come on, I don't care about cookies. It's the internet. How, how dangerous could it be? <laughs> Where's my copy and paste? Like, why are they trying to sell me stuff? I'm trying to get my job done. Oh, come on. Like, the hardest part of this, all right, look at this, ads. All right, we should be in business now. All right, so let's grab this. So what you want to do is you want to scan for security vulnerabilities as you go through this. That looks legit. Talking to a database, sure, why not? Cool. Let's just grab that. So here's the thing. Oh, I didn't grab it? Golly, I should be fired. This is why we use GIST. All right, copy. So one thing is, good programmers copy. Great programmers paste. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got our code. Now, the next thing we need to do is set up a database. Now, I am the world's most average DBA. So for me, I'm going to use uh, a hosted database service. And I like to keep it open source. So my favorite database is Postgres. And what I'm going to do here, listen, if you're a developer and you need to set up the database, there is no shame in clicking the button. Click database. Bam, like a pro, OK? You got to own it. <laughs> So I got this database set up, and I created a user. I actually do not know how to create a user, so I usually click this button, because I can't have to look it up all the time. So once I have the user created, I have a little EMV file so I can use natural tools. So the thing I like about this, I can use my existing tools to do my job. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're just going to get the environment variables for my connection string in my environment. And then we're going to see if we can connect to the actual database. And I can. Let's make sure we don't have any tables set up, so we're starting from scratch. Now, the next thing I need to do is actually set up the database schema, right? So there's some, uh, SQL is dope, by the way. If you don't know SQL, you should learn it. OK, so PSQL. And then we're going to just run this create database command. Uh-oh, we need to get our credentials. So pg.env. And then let's do this. And then, come on. Uh-oh, we got a database schema. And let's make sure we don't have any data in there. All right, we're starting from scratch. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to change into that directory where we've downloaded that production-ready code from the internet. And what we're going to do is we're going to give it credentials. Okay, So this should be cool, legit. This guy is a nice guy, I'm pretty sure. So I'm going to put those credentials in my environment. And then what we want to do now is just do something local. So when I build code, I like to test locally. I do not develop in the container. I test things on my local machine. So here what I want to do is do a quick build. 
And I'm using the new Vigo stuff so I can actually do uh, development work without using a Go path. So for me, I'm writing everything in Golang. And then what I'm going to do is just build the application. Ooh, and it compiles. That's legit. So let's try it. Let's see what we can do. So remember, the goal is we're going to take locations, and we want to trade them for geo coordinates so we can then talk to the weather service. So let's try that now. So we'll do weather data. Oh, it looks like it's working. All right, so look at this is like science, geo coordinates, OK? All right, and then we're getting the weather data. So if everything is legit, we should be able to do a query, and we have the weather data in our database. All right, so we're in business. All right, now that we've got our weather data, we need somewhere to actually run our code. And also, if you have the idea of running this command from your laptop in production every day, that's not how you do it. You might want to run this code in a cluster somewhere. So we need some infrastructure. So the next thing you do is we need a Kubernetes cluster. There's no other place better to run your code than Kubernetes. Marketing, I've done my job. All right, so, <laughs> so here's a Kubernetes cluster, but there's something interesting here. So there's a couple of tricks that I like to do. Here's my Kubernetes cluster. And one thing you can do that's really nice in GCP, you can actually have multiple node pools. So this is the 1.10.5 cluster. I have 13 nodes here, but I actually have those nodes split between two different node pools. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is I'm using the first general pool for my web apps, my batch jobs, long-running services. But this other node pool, I'm a big fan of Envoy. So you've been hearing a lot about Istio, but underneath Istio, there's this nice reverse proxy called Envoy. And Envoy, if you can think about it, is like a cloud-native replacement for Nginx or HA proxy. It has all the things that I need to do things like rate limiting and timeouts and retries. But I like to actually run Envoy as my edge load balancer, even in GCP. It's the same load balancer I run on my laptop, so I want some parity. So what I'm doing is I'm actually running each of my Envoy instances across these three nodes using what we call a daemon set. And then the last thing I do to set up my infrastructure, I create a load balancer that points to just those three machines. So if you think about it, I have a network appliance running inside of my cluster. No extra hops, no IP tables, straight to Envoy, then directly to my apps. So with the infrastructure in place, we can start to think about deploying our code. So let's go back to the command line really quickly. So the next thing I want to do is I don't want to execute this from my machine. So here's a cron job. Every five minutes, it's going to kick that code off for me automatically. So my goal is just to push this cron job up. But remember, the price of admission to Kubernetes is a container image. Here's my second trick that I like to do. I have this saying, don't ship build environments, ship artifacts. So when I, ship, when I build my containers, I actually just build my binaries locally, upload the artifact, and only have Docker package it in an image with the scratch base image. Right? So my images roughly are about 7 megs. And then watch how fast the builds are if I do it this way. So the first thing I'm going to do is build that application locally, take that binary, push it up to Google uh, Cloud Build, and Cloud Builder is going to do all the work for me. You'll notice another thing here. I don't have Docker installed on my machine. I can just push my builds there and get all of my images. So in just a few seconds, we'll have a container image. We're ready to go. And then we can actually use that cron job, and Kubernetes will keep it running. So kubectl apply-f cron.yaml. Right? So you'll notice there will be no pods created until we hit that five-minute mark. But we'll start watching just to see when things come up. So in about five minutes, you'll see the cron job kick off, and Kubernetes will keep a few of them around just in case I need to troubleshoot. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to move a little bit faster now, is I need to put an API in front of this. So what I'm going to do here is say kubectl apply dash f, and I have this weather API service. And then what I'm going to do here is just deploy that. And that's going to be a little bit faster because I want it right now. I already have the image on the container registry. It's going to pull it into the cluster, and it's going to start running. Now, here's the next cool thing that you can do in GKE. We've done a lot of work to make pods first-class citizens inside of Google Cloud. So you'll notice here, every pod in Kubernetes gets its own IP address. Now, the one thing that we do is we make those IPs native using a technology we call IP aliases. And what IP aliases does, it takes all of those container IPs and makes them first-class in my VPC. So my development box is a, is a VM inside of my VPC. So what I should be able to do is actually, without any port forwarding or extra hops, I should be able to make a call to my API service using the container IP. And look at that. 
directly talking to the container using a very natural development flow where I can work on another app while talking to apps inside of the cluster. That's pretty dope if you didn't think so. <laughs> All right, so we're moving along here. The next thing we want to do is get a web front end. Again, you kind of establish some patterns here. Build a, build a container, push it up, and describe to Kubernetes what you want to do. So here we'll build our web front end, and then we'll do this deployment. Now here's where things get a little bit interesting. We're not going to run one copy. We're going to let Kubernetes run three copies across that cluster for us. Now, once all of this is running, I have Envoy and a pre-configured IP and a DNS address that's pointing to this particular backend. So what I'm going to do now is pull this up, and we should be able to hit the weather backend. Oh, things are looking good. Let's see. All right. Everything seems to be working. Now, here's the thing. I've been the solo developer this whole time. I know the front end talks to the API server, and the API server talks to the database, but what happens is someone else on your team needs to check things out. The nice thing is I've been using open census. So again, I don't actually have a service mesh, but you can adopt all of these technologies a la carte. So if you want to add tracing to your application, you can bring in tools like the open census library that allows you to decorate your function calls or calls between apps and send that data to tools like Zipkin or Jaeger. In my case, I'm using Google Cloud, so we're going to send it to Stackdriver Trace. I'm going to pop over here to the tracing console, and then we're going to find one of those recent traces. So we can see one that just came in roughly around now, and we'll click on it. And you can actually see the end-to-end. -end. Traffic comes into the front end, the API, and then the API returns, but not before talking to the database. Now, here's the nice thing. If you trace this inside of your code base, and I click Show Events, I can come down here and see the exact SQL query that's being executed at that particular hop. Now, that gives you the ability to actually see what's going on and give people a lot more insight without checking out the code. All right, so we got all the patterns in place. Infrastructure, tracing, and now we need to think about something new. Now, we only have about five minutes left, so we're going to have to simulate this. It's not, when your boss shows up, it's like, hey, we need some new functionality. Can you get it done by Friday? All right, so the task is on. So we have this infrastructure. We got this nice pattern set up. And what we want to do now is start to think about something cool we can add in. We got a web front end, but that's like so 2017. You got to have a voice integration with your app if you want to be cool. If you can't talk to your application, you're probably doing it wrong, OK? So what we want to do is think about a tool called Dialogflow. You're not going to build your own natural language processing system from scratch. Some of you are probably trying. <laughs> There's a better way. So we're going to use Dialogflow. So again, let's walk through the pattern really quickly. We're going to write the application, and then we're going to build it and push it up. Now remember, the container image is just the price of admission, so we'll build this up. Now here's the other thing. You won't be the sole developer working on this application forever. Maybe there's someone else on the team that wants to contribute, and maybe they have no interest in writing YAML files or using Kubernetes from the command line. We've done a lot of work to make sure that Kubernetes works well from the UI. So we'll come over here, we'll go to the Kubernetes console, and we can click on workloads. Now notice here, all the things I did on the command line are reflected in the GKE console. Now, if I have a new person on the team that's not quite familiar with Kubernetes, this could be their workflow. We'll click deploy. And we've done something special here. We've integrated deeply with GCP, including the Google Container Registry. So if I click on this, I can drop down and find that image that I just created. It finds all the right tags, hit select, and then it fills out everything I need underneath. Let's give this a name. We'll call it the Weather Assistant. We have the right labels. And if I have multiple clusters, I can choose where it should deploy. Now, if you want to see what's going on underneath the hood, you can actually display that sweet, sweet YAML that you love so much. <laughs> and then we also give you an autoscaler to make sure you can respond to traffic changes. And we'll hit deploy. So that's going to do all the heavy lifting for me right through the UI. And just like that, it should be deployed. We'll switch over here, and we can see the weather assistant is now ready serving traffic. Now, the next thing we're going to do is make sure that we're ready by checking the health check. So here's the DNS name that I've assigned to this particular app. We'll hit it. We see everything is up working. And we can also see all my traffic is flowing through Envoy. I should be in good shape. All right, so we only have a few minutes left. Let's see if we can pull this last piece off. 
So I'm going to log into the Dialogflow console. This is also part of the Google Cloud platform. So Dialogflow allows you to design these voice integrations with your application. So we'll come here. There's a couple things we need to do. First, we need to make sure that our users have a good time with our application. So what we're going to do is we're going to define all this uh, verified inputs and create a few synonyms just in case they want to say things like Los Angeles or Los Angeles, California, USA to talk to the weather app. The next thing we're going to do is describe their intent. What does our user want to do? So here we want to have them check the temperature. Now there's no way I'm going to define everything or every phrase our users would do. So here, what I'm going to do is give Dialogflow a few training phrases. And notice how it's automatically pulling out those regions that match the entities that I described before. So we're ready to go. Now I want to send this to our web hub that we just got deployed. So we'll come here. We have a couple more steps. We'll go to Fulfillment. And in Fulfillment, you'll see that I'm just putting in that same URL that I had earlier that's pointing to my Kubernetes stack. All right? You have all kind of integrations that you can do, but this time we just want to do the Google Assistant. Now, this whole time I've been using my uh, Pixel book to do this demo, and this is something that I also think a part of the end-to-end -end experience at Google. So we want to test out this. Now, I could use the simulator, or I can actually come down here and use my laptop. Now, to prove that this is real, we're going to look at the logs for the Assistant to make sure Kelsey isn't cheating. All right, so kubectl logs. We'll give it that container name. And we can just stream the logs here. So we can see it's listening, but there's nothing there yet. So if I hit the Assistant button on my Pixel book, we should be able to talk to this thing. Yeah, whatever. All right, talk to the, talk to the local weather service. Sure, here's the test version of local weather. Hello, Kelsey. Hello. Looks like you have a pretty large crowd here. I hope the demo gods are on your side. I hope so, too. <laughs> All right, so let's give this a go. What's the current temperature in Los Angeles, California? The current temperature in Los Angeles, California, USA, is 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Thank you. Okay, I gotta admit, that was pretty dope. <laughs> 